Okay, so we'll, we'll begin and we'll continue along these lines tonight. I hope that you'll find it to be a blessing. I, I'm certainly some of these statements that I came across, I've never seen them before and they really were a blessing to me and I pray it's gonna be a blessing to you and it does seem to uh, really pivot off of ideas that were shared last Sabbath. So I'm gonna pray and then we'll get into it. Well, Father, I come to you and name your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you that we always are able to gather together on Sabbath and I'm grateful for this platform, for the times that we live in that allow those of us that have been singled out by belief systems that are no longer held or no longer embraced by a fellowship that we have claimed to be a part of and want to be a part of, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that we can gather together. It, it allows us to come together in your name, and you've promised where two or more gather in your name that there you are in the midst. And so. I think of statements that say you'll work in a way that is different than expected by the masses, by the majority of those that profess your name here at the end. And I do believe you work through this, this medium of communication. I pray for wisdom and discernment around the message this evening. I ask for you to uh, give me thoughts and words that would, would bless the brethren and not for any good that's in me. I desire to be a blessing and I, I believe you'll answer this prayer according to your riches and glory. We pray these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. So last Sabbath, we read a statement from 1SG. And I remember when I read this statement the first time, and I thought about some of the ideas that are floating around in our movement when I read it, that, wow, this is a real piece of ammunition. And then... Um, it kind of just slipped my mind, but the Lord brought me back to it. And it's found in One Spiritual Gifts, page 116. I'm going to read the statement again, and there's, there's one sentence in there that we'll pivot off of this evening as we go forward. But it's in One Spiritual Gifts, page 116, and we'll read it. It says, I saw that the heavenly host was filled with indignation at this bold work of Satan. I inquired why all these delusions should be suffered <clears throat> to take effect upon the minds of men when the angels of God were powerful and if commissioned, could easily break the enemy's power. Then I saw that God knew that Satan would try every art to destroy man. Therefore, he had caused his word to be written out and had made his designs to man so plain that the weakest need not err. Then after he had given his word to man, he had carefully preserved it so that Satan and his angels through any agent or representative could not destroy it. While other books might be destroyed, this holy book was to be immortal. Now that's interesting, that word immortal, especially when we think of the tree of life, which gave immortality to Adam and Eve as they would eat of it. And of course, after they sin, and I actually read some very interesting statements on that this week as well, but you know, after they sin, they were barred from that tree that they would not be able to live. But the essence of that tree was passed down to Adam and Eve's posterity. Uh, that life force allowed them to live for a very long time before the flood. So they weren't allowed to partake of it anymore after they sinned and thus live forever. But still, it had a life-giving effect upon them. And this is the sentence I want to focus on as we go forward. But then We'll finish this quote out. It says, and down near the close of time, when the delusions of Satan should increase, the copies of this book were to be so multiplied that all who desired it might have a copy of God's revealed will to man. All who desire can have God's will revealed through his word. And if they would, might arm themselves against the deceptions and lying wonders of Satan. So when we think of this idea of immortality, then we have to think of the tree of life. Now, if we go to Revelation chapter 20, in Revelation chapter 20, we read that one day again, actually it's Revelation 22, forgive me. 
Revelation 22, it will be in verse 2, we read that again, we will eat of the tree of life. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Now, this was the profound thought and idea that came to me uh, this week in my devotions around this particular verse. The tree of life, are we able to eat of that tree even now or partake of it? And the spirit of prophecy would tell us that we are able to, and I want to share with you some quotes around this. After the entrance of sin, this is taken from Signs of the Times, March 31st, 1909. Signs of the Times, March 31st, 1909. After the entrance of sin, the heavenly husbandman transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above. But its branches hang over the wall to the lower world. That's a very interesting statement right there. But anyway, we'll keep going. Through the redemption purchased by the blood of Christ, we may still eat of its life-giving fruit. So we can eat of the tree of life even now. Now, it's interesting. She doesn't say it here, but she gives hint as to what it is. Of Christ, it is written, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is the foundation of life. Obedience to him is the life-giving power that gladdens the soul. Christ declares, I am the bread of life. Now, when we think of bread, in relation to that symbology, the bread is what? The bread is the word of God or also the flesh, which is the word. Christ became flesh. The word became flesh. So we start to see here a connection. We're going to see she further solidifies this. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay. Then she goes down in another statement. Taken from Manuscript 71, 1898, she says, the leaves of the trees are proffered you. They are sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Take them, eat them, digest them, and your faint-heartedness will pass away. Okay, so eat the trees of life. Sweet is that when we think of uh, in Revelation chapter 10, when John is told to take the, edel, the little book, and to eat it up, it was sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his belly. What did he, he was eating? The prophecies of, of Daniel. That's the little book, the words. The word of God is, well, we eat it. The table of showbread. This is all a symbolism of, word, of, of God's word. Well, watch what she says here then. Let all bear in mind that the tree of life bears 12 manner of fruits. This represents the spiritual work of our earthly missions. The word of God is to us the tree of life. Well, there you go, okay? We could already have deciphered this just from the word of God alone, that it is this way, but here we have the spirit of prophecy to confirm this idea. Every portion of the scripture have its use, and every part of the word is some lesson to be learned. Then learn how to study your Bibles. Now, there you go, right there. We read about the parable of the tares. This was maybe two or three Sabbaths ago now that we talked about that. And the idea that those that are wheat are born of the word of God of truth. And those that are tares are born of error or of incorrect principles. Okay, so principles that are founded in error. So knowing how to study your Bible, well, that's something we as Seventh-day Adventists should everyone know. And we as leaders, it's an admonishment to leadership, anyone who might listen to this, it is our sovereign responsibility to teach others how to study their Bibles. That's why I would say that really indwelling word is more of a teaching ministry than anything at this point, because it is important to understand how to study. And it was something I longed for for a long time in my Christian experience. And the Lord finally showed me how to study. 
by Miller's prophetic rules of Bible interpretation. And this is what we're admonished. So then learn how to study your Bibles, right? If you want to partake of the tree of life, there's lessons to be learned from God's word. Learn how to study your Bible. That's simple. And then however God affects the rest of it, that's his prerogative. This book is not a heap of odds and ends. It is an educator. The word of God is an educator. Your own thoughts must be called into exercise before you can really be benefited by Bible study. Spiritual sinew and muscle must be brought to bear upon the word. And as you bring that to the word, then the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance the words of Christ. He will enlighten the mind and guide the research. Okay, so he's going to guide you and enlighten your mind as you come to the word but if you don't come to the word, can you expect enlightening and guidance independent of it? I don't think so, brethren. And that's taken from letter three, 1898. And if you think about it, we take, say, a William Miller or even take Ellen White for that matter. Before there is a great and what would be referred to as an extraordinary experience in the movings of the spirit of God and however that works, because I don't believe that we really are able to define that. We just know it works. Is that uh, there is time in the word of God. It comes first. It's not a secondary thing. You don't secondarily get it. You do that first before you would have an extraordinary experience above and beyond that. And anybody can participate in that ordinary experience, which is still extraordinary because it changes the character. It makes the person a different person. We're gonna see some quotes around that as well. But now we've established, and if you've read ahead of me, you've already read this statement, but we've established clearly that the word of God is the tree of life. And then what does she say? In another statement, the Review and Herald, January 26th, 1897, Christ is the source of our life, the source of immortality, he is the tree of life, and to all who come to him, he gives spiritual life. But how are you going to come to Christ? How are you going to get the spiritual life? It's through the word of God. They're one and the same. It's very simple. This is not hard, and we can see why she could make statements like this and use these things synonymously for one another. They're both figures for one another. The tree of life is a figure for Christ in our time now, but it's also, it is the word of God. Christ is the truth of all that we find in the Father. The definition of heaven is the presence of Christ. Manuscript 58. The definition of heaven is the presence of Christ. We need the presence of Christ. How do we have the presence of Christ? How do we bring him into our lives? We've been over this over and over again, but we should understand this very clearly and believe it. It is by the word of God. So now, then I came across... Matthew 17, Matthew 7, verse 14. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. And there's something very interesting she says in this statement. And I want you to see this. We'll kind of discuss more why I'm going along these lines, but, but first let's just look at this. In Matthew 7, verse 14, it says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto eternal life or which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, I was, I've was i read this before in Mount of Blessing, and I, um, I'm, I'm reading Mount of Blessing, and I'm reading Christ's Object Lessons right now. That's, that's my Spirit of Prophecy primary readings that I'm doing again. And I don't know, I, I guess it, I, I'd forgotten, or I had, hadn't really made the impression on me like it did this time, is that the idea of, of going through the narrow gate was that, you know, in those times, and you can actually kind of see it, even in uh, in this country, the battlements or the safety, they're on, it's on a hill. Like, it seems to be up on a hill, because why? You, you need to be able to look down upon your enemies. It's hard to take advantage uh, of something that's above. They, they can fight you easily from above. You, you want the higher ground, okay? And so there would be steeps that they would have to climb and ascend to go through that narrow gate. But if the sun went down, they closed that gate. And if you didn't get there in time, you were locked out. So you couldn't be careless and indifferent. And this is the idea about striving for heaven 
is not for the careless and the indifferent. And they have to understand that, you know, there is, there needs to be great earnest diligence and ever upward climbing in our experience with the Lord, if we would gain heaven. Okay, so that was a profound thought to me is that, wow, you know, we, we just can't be slack in our experience. And sometimes it's easy to become complacent. We certainly wouldn't want to teach any kind of doctrine or any kind of idea that might even allow for complacency of any kind. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to root ourselves in the idea that we, we have some kind of experience that we've arrived. Okay, that's just not, that's just not it. We, we always have to be climbing upward. But anyway, this statement is taken from Mount of Blessing. Uh, and we'll read here, it's Mount of Blessing, page 140. The road may be rough and the ascent steep. There may be pitfalls upon the right hand and upon the left. We may have to endure toil in our journey. When weary, when longing for rest, we may have to toil on. When faint, we may have to fight. When discouraged, we must still hope. But with Christ as our God. Now that's, that's what I want us to focus on today. Is Christ really our guide? And I'm not talking about like in an ethereal sense. I mean, is he literally our guide leading us? Does, does he walk beside us? I mean, do you believe that? I do, okay? I believe that. I don't believe that Christ in a sense is confined and cannot do so because I understand that, uh, or at least I believe it can clearly be shown actually that he is capable of omnipresence. Okay, that's, that's something his father gave him. That's a gift that was given to him in his reinstatement as the son of God, having ascended from this world. Okay, and I see spirit of prophecy supports it. But anyway, do we really believe it? And do we want to let go of that idea? Or, or if we do believe it for something else, or if we have never embraced it, then why would we not want it would be the question I would ask. But but let's just keep going here. She says, but with Christ as our God, we shall not fail of reaching the desired haven at last. Christ himself has trodden the rough way before us and has smoothed the path of our feet. Now, I want you to watch this. It doesn't get any plainer than this, brother. All the way up the steep road leading to eternal life are wellsprings of joy to refresh the weary. Those who walk in wisdom's ways are, even in tribulation, exceeding joyful. For capital H-E, whom their soul loveth. And who is that? That's Christ. For Christ, whom their soul loveth, walks invisible beside them. Okay? Do you believe that or not? Or do you say that's something else? At each upward step, now, it becomes very clear. Let's keep reading. At each upward step, they more distinctly, dis, they more, excuse me. At each upward step, they discern more distinctly the touch of his hand, capital H-I-S, his hand. At every step, brighter gleamings of glory from the unseen, capital U-N-S-E-E-N. -E Not lowercase uppercase, that's Christ, fall upon their path, their songs of praise, reaching ever higher note, ascend to join the songs of angels before the throne. The path of the righteous is as the light of dawn that shineth more and more under the perfect day. That's taken from Mount of Blessing 140. Now, I guess there really is a conundrum in our movement around this, and it's sad shouldn't be there, doesn't have to be there, but it is nonetheless. And it's been capitalized on, divided many of us from each other, which is sad. That ought not to be the case, but it has. John 14, I want to go there. I want to look at this again because we as father, son believers, we know these verses and we pivot off these verses when we try to tell someone about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is not a third person. Now, I want to share an idea with you tonight, and I think that some of the confusion around here uh, on all of this is because of how the translators translated something, and did they have a right to translate it this way? Well, at least they thought they did, but 
As I've been doing some study, even on the book of Daniel and the daily, and this idea of the word sacrifice is added, I think that I, this past Wednesday, as we did a study on that, came across an understanding of how to determine whether or not an italicized word really fits, or maybe even an idea really fits in the scriptures. Because you have to remember, translators made decisions about the word they used. There might have been another word they could have used, but they chose that particular word. Now, that particular word in our mind would suggest some form of doctrine, but in its context, is that really how it should be taken? Now, I want you to watch this then. In John 14, let's read through all of it first and then go back and kind of break it down. If he then, I'll go ahead and screen share right after this. If ye then love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, we know this is Christ at this point. He's very clear. Okay, it's, you, you know who the spirit of truth is. The world doesn't know it. The world can't understand it, but you do because, well, I'm with you. I am it. And one day he says, and shall be in you. But that's, we'll, we'll come back to that. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, the world seeth me no more. But ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Now, the last part of this is, if somebody manifests themselves to you, okay, or going back if we read there again in verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you. And that word with uh, is basically among, okay? He can abide among you forever, okay? And then we have in verse 21, the idea that, that he's manifesting himself to us. Then, a lot of confusion has occurred around this idea of in, right? Because if you go on and you read here, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he shall dwell with you and shall be, or shall be in you. Now that word in, we talked about this before, that is the Greek en, okay? It can also be interpreted as, upon or by. Now, I've tried to explain this before, and I, I, I thought it would make sense to explain it by thoughts, but how do you then explain this idea going down further where it says in verse 20, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Jesus in his Father, how is that? And how are we in Christ right now when we're here? So the translators chose to use the word I in. But what if they had chosen to use the word by? Because that word could be used in the context of what we're seeing here in the very beginning and at the very close of this few statements here that Jesus is making about if you love me and keep my commandments, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to send a comforter to be with you. Then, and then it closes, I will manifest myself to you. Then I don't believe you're taking liberty to say that the word by might actually make a lot more sense. Let's read it with that and see what happens. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be by you, upon you, among you. Just as Christ was among his disciples, just as he walked by them, and I think this will make more sense as we continue, but I just want to share this thought. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 
Yet a little while the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am, I am by my Father, and ye by me, and I by you. You see, when Jesus ascended, what did he do? He ascended and he sat down at the right hand of his father on the throne. He didn't go into his father. He ascended and sat beside him, which is a declaration that the kingdom has now been given to him. Because of what he's done, he now possesses this world. It's his. It's rightfully his again, and he has the power to give or take, depending on their condition. And we are know that very well as Adventists. That all hinges on the investigative judgment about who Christ will give the kingdom to and who he will withhold it from. Okay, he definitely will automatically withhold it from those that have never professed him. Those who have professed him, they will have to be weighed in the balance to see if their profession matches their possession. But that makes a whole lot more sense, brethren, when you start to understand maybe from the perspective of by. Translators chose the word in, but they could have chosen the word by, and if it was by, well, it would save a lot of confusion that we're dealing with right now. And I'll explain why I think that more so. So then it closes, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. I will be by him. I will manifest myself. Now, when we go back and we look at what we just read in the spirit of prophecy, is that so far-fetched? All the way up the steep road leading to eternal life or wellsprings of joy to refresh the weary. Those who walk in wisdom's ways, even tribulation exceeding joyful. For he whom their soul loveth walks invisible beside them. At each upward step, they discern more distinctly the touch of his hand. At every step, brighter gleamings of the glory from the unseen fall upon their path. And their songs of praise reaching ever a higher note, ascend to join the songs of the angels before the throne. The path of the righteous is as the light of dawn that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Well, using the word by instead of in there in John 14 certainly makes this make a lot of sense. So I see that, or at least I believe, <clears throat> as I've meditated on this, and it seems like what's happened is there was this strong contingency within our movement that Jesus Christ literally dwells in you. And some who study the spirit of prophecy in the Bible can see that that just doesn't really technically work. It's a form of possession, actually, and Christ doesn't possess us because if someone's possessed, their will is no longer their own. We have the ability to give our will over to Christ and he will form it and give it back to us and that we will delight to do his will but he still would not be in possession of you, per se. He would not be controlling you. You still would be able to exercise your free will for or against that. Anytime we see possession in the Bible, something, a, de a demon inside of someone, they, they have no control over themselves anymore. They are, they are subject to that presence or, well, the demoniacs, they had legions of that presence in them. Christ doesn't do that. So then there's a need to answer that. And so another side comes to answer it. And they say, okay, no, it's not Christ really in you. It's, it's the angels. It's the angels with you working however, however they're trying to explain it. And, and they're using some spirit of prophecy statements, actually obscure because the weight of evidence the predominant weight of evidence is on what we're talking about. Now, you've got some obscure statements. Okay, so what do we do? Um, are we going to be intellectually honest? Because I'm going to tell you something. If you're intellectually honest with these ideas, then you would have to basically forsake the spirit of prophecy because you now have it in conflict with itself, and you can't do that. We've shown very clearly uh, that in Zechariah 4, the two olive trees, the two witnesses, the two anointed ones, okay? That is the Old and New Testament. That's the word of God, okay? That's not angels, all right? And you can't prove that any other way from the Bible. 
All right, you've got some spirit of prophecy statements that seem to conflict with that and say something different, but you cannot use the spirit of prophecy to define the word of God. So if you're going to hold totally fast to that, then what you have now is a false prophet. But I don't believe that. I don't believe that's the case. And I thought we would talk about this Sabbath. We'll cover it next Sabbath. But if you're going to be really intellectually honest, you would have to walk away. Now, I'm not going to do that because I know better. I think it's off balance, okay? I think that's the problem. And I'm certainly not going to try to tell people that if I if, if I brought somebody, like we met a couple the other day, okay? They're clearly, they were not Christians. My wife was able to minister to them the health message. The health message is the right arm of the gospel. Okay, so that opens the door to begin to share with them more about, you know, who we are and what we do, right? Because they're interested in their health. And then we can tell them why we know these things and why we learn these things. But am I going to sit down with those people? Let's just say, and I'm going to open up the Bible to them. And am I going to try to tell them that their experience is going to be founded solely in angels, that angels now bring the presence of Christ to them? How can I show them that from the word of God? Oh, but I've got it in the spirit of prophecy. Well, then they're not going to listen to me. Okay, that's not where this is going to start. But if I show them in the word of God and from the word that Christ will come and dwell among and in them by the word, the promises that they can claim, brings the very power and presence of Christ to them. They can see those things manifesting in their lives. I mean, I had a testimony today. We've been praying for a brother and his children and his son open to this message now. I mean, this is, this is reality. This is rooted. I can show this, okay? So am I going to forsake all of that? No, I can't do that. I have to then say, what is going on here? Ellen White's clear. Christ walks beside us. Now, I tell you the truth in Christ. I lie not. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. Okay, I just merely desire to be led of the Lord. This morning, I get up. I come in here, as I always do in this room. I drink my water. I get myself settled. I pray. And then I ask the Lord, please show me where you'd have me to go. I've been in Mount of Blessing. So I was going to read something in Mount of Blessing. But as I was opening my book i have a conflict of age series got desire of ages in it acts of the apostles all the all the you know conflict series i'm open i'm i am in desire of ages i'm making my way to christ's object lessons our amount of blessing and i come across this chapter um the chapter is uh where 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 have you laid my lord i think where is my it's it's the chapter about uh, he is risen that's it he is risen it's that chapter and i i was going to keep going and something just thought i should read this i'm like okay does it make sense to read this but i feel i should so i read it now i think you'll see why Trouble seemed crowding upon trouble. On the sixth day of the week, they had seen their master die. On the first day of the next week, they found themselves deprived of his body, and they were accused of having stolen it away for the sake of deceiving the people. They despaired of ever correcting the false impressions that were gaining ground against them. They feared the enmity of the priest and the wrath of the people. They longed for the presence of Jesus who had helped them in every perplexity. Okay, so this is about the disciples. The disciples, they are hiding now because, you know, they're afraid that they're going to be accused of taking Christ's body and they're not going to be able to get away from that idea. So in the past, Jesus had always delivered them. I mean, you think about, you know, they're on the, they're on the lake there. And the, the waves are roaring and the storm comes and he stands up and he calms the waves. He stills the storm. He lifts Peter out of the water. He walks like all these different times when, you know, Christ is there to, to deliver them or to rescue them. And they're longing for his presence to be with them. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Often they repeated the words. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Lonely and sick at heart. They remembered his words. If they do these things in a green tree, 
what shall be done in the dry. They met together in the upper chamber and closed and fastened the doors, knowing that the fate of their beloved teacher might be at any time theirs. And all of the time that they might have been rejoicing in the knowledge of a risen Savior, in the garden, Mary had stood weeping when Jesus was close beside her. Her eyes were so blinded by tears that she did not discern him. And the hearts of the disciples were so full of grief that they did not believe the angel's message or the words of Christ himself, which had they believed the words of Christ, they would never have felt forsaken by his presence because they would have known he had to die. It had to be done. But on the third day, he would rise again and he would be with them again. And then he would send the comforter and be with them. Now watch what she says here. How many are still doing what these disciples did? How many echo Mary's despairing cry? They have taken away the Lord, and we know not where they have laid him. To how many might the Savior words be spoken? Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? He is close beside them, but in their tear-blinded eyes, they do not discern him. He speaks to them but they do not understand. And we know how Christ speaks to us. He speaks to us by his word. We know how he's close to us. He's close to us by his word. We have a divine audience with Christ and the father through the word. But yet, because we don't understand the power of the word, we don't understand his presence and that he's with us. Do you really not want that? Do you want to trade that for something else? I don't want to. I would think that you would be wise to embrace the concept and the belief that Christ literally does walk beside you by his spirit. Now, how do I explain that? I can't, and I'm not supposed to, and you can't either. And you're not supposed to. And I think part of this confusion and problem that we have is that men have endeavored to try to explain something that is unexplainable. And they're trying to use spirit of prophecy to make that explanation. And it's just unexplainable. You can't do that. You, by faith, believe it or you don't believe it. And it's the same thing that we see here that we just read in Desire of Ages. If their faith had have been strong, in the words that Christ had spoken, if they had have believed and understood, if they had not have been confused by other false teaching, I would encourage you to read this chapter, then they would have been able to hear the words of Christ and receive them, and they would have known that they were not forsaken, that this just was a part of the process. And we're not forsaken ever either, brethren. He was with them in the wilderness. He was the pillar of fire by day. He was the cloud by night. He walked beside them, okay? He walked beside them physically in his incarnation as man. And he ascended on high and he still is able to be with us, his people, by his spirit. And to teach something different is another gospel. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I don't recognize it. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's never been my experience. And so my sheep know my voice. Another one, they won't follow. I'm not going to follow that. And people have followed it. And where did they go? They left here. And I don't know why they did, but any doctrine that would cause someone to leave this idea is a dangerous doctrine, if you ask me. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. You know, I might say some things in the after discussion just to even show you why that is such a dangerous thing, but I won't say it here. I'm going to close with one more statement and then we'll pray. This is taken from Review and Herald, October 6, 1891, paragraph 3. Review and Herald, October 6, 1891, paragraph 3. Here are the mighty agencies for moving the world. The cross of Calvary brings under tribute every power of those who believe on Christ, that they may be instrumentalities for the saving of souls. So, you know, you can be a part of the agency for the saving of souls. Okay, angels are an agency as well. They work in this, nature and agency, providence and agency, but the most important and the most direct access is the word of God, okay? So anyway, 
Human effort is to be united with the divine. It must derive its efficacy from heaven. We are to be laborers together with God. The Lord is represented as opening the hearts of men and women to receive the word. Jesus does the opening. He's the one that does the moving. And then it goes on to say, and the Holy Spirit makes the word effective. And how that happens, you don't need to necessarily understand or try to explain to another. It works by faith, whereby are given unto succeeding great and precious promises that by these he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides all this, add to your faith virtue. Faith activates this. And so then it says, those who receive the truth have that faith, which leads to decided action which works by love and purifies the soul. Thus, the truth is a sanctifier. That's the word of God. It is a transforming power is seen. Its transforming power is seen on the character. When it has been admitted into the inner sanctuary of the soul, okay? So when it lives within you, which is Christ in you, it does not operate superficially, leaving the heart unchanged because Christ changes the heart. The word changes. It does not awaken the emotions merely to the neglect of the judgment and will, but goes down to the very depths of the nature and brings the whole being into harmonious action. Review and Herald, October 6, 1891. So as we close, I said I was going to ask you a question based on everything that we've shared today that I hope you would meditate on for a week. And just really think about this. Do you really want to trade the abiding presence of Christ that you are promised? It is a literal thing. We can't see it, but it does happen. It's promised to those who will believe for it. Do you really want to trade that for some other idea? Because I believe in this thing around the angels. There's a desire to try to somehow explain the presence of Christ and his omnipresence by not understanding that he really is omnipresent. They say, well, he's in heaven. He's confined there in his humanity. And he needs the angels to be the eyes and ears in his presence. He needs the angels to bring you the word. His communication is by ministration of angels. And it's only in this idea that way. I say, do you really want to trade <laughs> a clear line of truth from God's word as well as the spirit of prophecy for that idea or do you want to embrace the truth as it is in Jesus that he literally does walk beside us as his people if we believe it that's the question I'd ask you to meditate on before we go any further and with that I'll close in prayer Father again I come to you in the name of your son the Lord Jesus Christ and I want you to know I am so grateful, my Savior Jesus, that I can talk to you and I believe that you, by your spirit, hear me and are by me. And I don't know how all that works, but I know in so many instances in my life that you have been present in one way or another. However you affect that, I'm not so concerned, but I'm grateful for it. And I pray my brethren would believe for it too and just have it as a reality because one thing's for sure the time of trouble that we're getting ready to go into such as the world has never known if we've not become assured of your divine presence now we will not know what to do when it is completely withdrawn from this world and we can't access it other than by the words that have been placed in our minds that we hold fast to the promises that you have given the assurance of salvation to those who have forsaken every sin and let go of everything that would beset them in this world. So I thank you for your love and mercy to us. And I pray that you would just bring these truths home to our hearts. And that they would burn within us. And I pray these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen.